We're now going to look at another type of abnormal rhythm that is seen reasonably frequently in the coronary care situation, and this is heart blocks. So David, wh what do we actually mean by the term heart block? What happens is there's a disturbance within the conducting system, and depending on whereabouts the disturbance is, then we'll see different types of heart block. Um, and what it tends to mean is that it can, it can either be that there's a, a pause between the atrial and ventricular contractions right through to the worst case scenario where there may be no association between the atrial and ventricular contractions. So there's a block somewhere in the internal conducting system yeah. that, that is somewhere between the sinoatrial node and the Purkinje fibres. That's right, yeah. And it can be of varying severities. It can. So, so how, how do we classify heart blocks? There, there are four classifications of heart block. We can have first degree heart block. We can have second degree Morbitz type 1 heart block, second degree Morbitz type 2, and complete or third degree heart block. We're now going to take a look at the first of those. Okay, what we're looking at here, Johnny, is a first degree heart block. Initially, this looks reasonably normal, doesn't it? It does. It, it looks very similar to a sinus rhythm. But as <coughs> we said earlier on, there needs to be a specific time gap between the P wave and the R wave. And as you can see here, the P wave and the R wave, the distance between them is slightly elongated. We call a normal PR interval 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. Or if we were looking at it on a piece of ECG paper, that would be three to five small squares. That would be the normal range. That would be the normal range. And in this, what we're seeing is something that w is greater than 0.2 of a second. This may well have no clinical significance at all. It may be normal for the person that comes in with it and doesn't require any specific treatment. The second of the heart blocks is what we call second degree Morbitz type 1 or wenke back. And what we see here is a normal PR interval that starts to get longer, as in a first degree block. So it, it increases in length until a QRS is dropped altogether. So the PR interval starts normal, gets progressively longer over several beats, until and that results in the dropping of a QRS. It's complex altogether. So that's the, then there's a block between the atria and ventricular contraction on that beat, and then it goes back and starts again with a normal and increasing PR interval until the beat's dropped. And what would cause this? Th this is normally um, a conduction problem in the AV node. The next rhythm that we'll look at is Morbitz type 2, second degree block. And what we have here is normal PR intervals, but then a beat's dropped completely, and we just have the P wave, or we'll have a, what we could call a ventricular standstill. Again, this is due to con poor conduction through the atrioventricular bundle. It's, it's probably further down at the start of the bundle of his. This is of more clinical significance. This, we, we, we feel that this is a more dangerous rhythm than type 1 because this can actually lead to complete heart block. So the second degree type 1, you tend just to observe it without any particular treatment. Yeah, but type 2 may well require piercing because it can lead to complete heart block or even, in very severe cases, ventricular standstill. The final heart block is what we call complete heart block or third degree block. And what we have here is P waves running at, at a regular rate, normally about 80, as the, because that's the normal rate that the SA node would fire off. So the, the atria are working normally, basically. Yeah. But what's happening is that, that impulse then isn't getting to the ventricles. And what we have is this broad bizarre on the screen, ventricular rate. And it's what we call the fastest pacemaker rules. The Purkinje fibres themselves can actually produce a pacemaker, although the rate will be much lower than the atrial rate.
but there'll be no association between the atrial contraction and the ventricular contraction at all. So there's no impulse at all getting through from the atria to the ventricles, and the ventricles are just contracting at their own idioventricular right. rate. Yeah. The management for this, this, this patient may obviously come in quite unwell and hypertensive, and the management for this is would be a pacemaker. Uh, and could the idioventricular rate be lower than this? Or? What, what we would tend to see would be a lower rate. Lower rate. Probably so it about, tends to be a low rate. Probably about 30. Which is not consistent with life holding for, for those patients. Well, th these patients will be unwell. They'll, they'll, they'll be hypotensive. What, what you'll tend to find is that these are patients, a lot of these people walk about with complete heart block and don't realise, but when every time they stand up they faint and they're brought into hospital with a history of falls and once we get them onto the monitor, this is what we'll may see. So the treatment of this, as we said earlier on, would be a pacemaker and what we can now look at is what we would expect to see in a rhythm of somebody that was paced. Okay. So what we see here is a ventricular rate, there's no atrial contractions at all, no P waves that we can see, but we have this large spike before the ventricle. And what's that? That's what we call the pacing spike. So what happens is the pacemaker sends electrical signal down to the ventricles, which stimulates them to beat. This is the external, external. pacemaker that's been fitted now. Yeah. And we can then vary the rate so we provide a, an adequate cardiac output. But these patients, this may be a temporary complete heart block following an MI, or it may well be that these patients will need a permanent pacemaker put in. All right, thanks to David for demonstrating those rhythms to us. But there's one thing we would like to stress before we finish, and we have actually mentioned this, is that the ECG is an aid. It's not something that should govern our clinical decision making and it should never substitute our, our, our skills of clinical observation. As we said, always treat the patient, not the monitor. So whenever you see something you're not sure about on a monitor, don't worry about it. Go and look at your patient, see how your patient is, assess the level of consciousness, ask them how they're feeling, take the patient's pulse. Remember, this is just part of the information that we're using. Uh, part, part of the, uh, it's just an aid we're using to gain clinical information about our patients but it must never substitute the hands-on clinical skills that we all need to practice as healthcare professionals.